So it's an absolute pleasure to introduce uh, John Turborg. John's got an affiliation with us here at JCU. Uh, he and his wife, uh, Lisa Davenport, uh, oftentimes come to here to Australia, to North Queensland, and then use that as a base for traveling around and exploring uh, different parts of the world. Uh, and they've also had a, a lot of intellectual interaction with us here. Um, John was given an appointment at JCU as a Tropical Thinkers in Residence, which is the first time we've ever appointed anybody like that, and the money came from the Vice Chancellor. And um, so John's had that role, and he's continued it, and he and Lisa have been very welcome parts of our test community. John is one of the most famous scientists you'll ever meet in your entire life. Absolute, hands down. National Academy of Science, mul multiple national academies. He's won the Daniel Girard Medal, which is the highest medal that the Ecological Society of America gives out. He's won a MacArthur Genius Award, which almost nobody that I know has ever won. Um, he's just been at the forefront of his field. I always say this because it's true. John was the person I wanted to work with for my PhD. I didn't get accepted to work with him. But, and for, so John was trained at Harvard University, both undergraduate and PhD. Uh, he then went on to positions at uh, Maryland and a longtime uh, professor at Princeton University. And more recently, he's moved down to Duke University, where he has a very high-profile chair there, largely because I think John just really likes bird watching and getting out where there's nature, and uh, he wasn't getting quite enough of that in Princeton. But anyway, uh, we'll turn it over to you, John, and thank you again for uh, speaking to us today, but I, I know it's going to be a provocative topic. Thanks, John. Be sure. Thank you, Bill, for the kind words. It's a great pleasure to be here with all you Tessians. My only uh, regret is that I'm not there in person. Often we are. As Bill said, we come almost every year. But uh, right now we're, we're in uh, Florida, nine time zones away. So uh, what I want to do to tell you about today is work that Lisa and I have done over a decade, just starting in 2009 and continuing to do. 2019 on um, megafauna in closed canopy tropical forests. This is an almost un, unplowed terrain scientifically because the forest imposes so many challenges that uh, make uh, it, 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 doing anything more than than uh, than indirect uh, observations because it's it's dangerous to be in the forest with uh, uh, megafauna elephants particularly so uh, the world hasn't been able to learn very much about this um, so why do we study megafauna um, for quite a bunch of reasons uh, uh, first historical they've been around since uh, the uh, beginning of the Jurassic and or, or Triassic I should say and uh, have been a major feature of animal communities, whether reptiles or mammals, for uh, as it's, as it says, two hundred million years. Um, they have come into prominence recently uh, through the term of ecological engineer, um, because they have the capacity to alter entire ecosystems in and drive them into alternative states. And uh, not many organisms have this potential, and most of them are called keystone species. The Pacific sea otter, for example, is one such species. Elephants can do it with vegetation on land. And uh, there's a third reason that's not such a pleasant one, in that uh, the world's megafauna has shrunk down to tiny remnants in Asia and Africa and is under huge pressure uh, and uh, we we have no way of knowing how much longer uh, wild megafaunal communities, as least of all intact ones, will continue to exist. So uh, this is a case of if you don't do it now, uh, then when? Um, and finally, uh, megafauna have further interests in how uh, herbivory interact with vegetation. And uh, as I'll point out, uh, it's not... Uh, obvious whether herbivores increase or decrease the diversity of vegetation through their activities. But uh, I'll have a little more to say about that in a minute. Australia, of course, had its own megafauna, most of which disappeared about 40,000 years ago, long before 
megafauna disappeared in other parts of the world. And uh, I love this uh, this artist's conception. Uh, there's uh, Jenny Ornis uh, on the upper left, the giant bird, and uh, the diprotodons and these short-faced kangaroos that were there were uh, browsers, not grazers, and all of those are gone, uh, as are the uh, suite of uh, carnivores that preyed on them. Megalamia on the left, the, the horrific five-meter-long monitor lizard, and in the middle, the thalicoleo, the, the marsupial lion, and, of course, the familiar thalassine, but sadly, all of the mammals in that picture extinct, though there's still crows and galahs. So Australia had its megafauna and one wonders how uh, how the uh, environment the vegetation looked uh, under that regime certainly it was different from what it is today um, now uh, ele elephants and other megafauna are still found in mostly intact communities in parts of africa and parts of southeast asia so lisa and i Worked for several years in Gabon in Central Africa, right on the equator. And uh, then uh, after we met uh, our future collaborator, Aimsa Campos Arceis, we uh, switched over to working with Indian elephants in the forests of Malaysia. So we'll start with Africa and then later switch over to Malaysia. Now, as you can see, um, this is an African savanna elephant, and uh, these animals eat trees. Um, and uh, they can do a lot of damage to a tree uh, if they're uh, so inclined. And uh, yet, uh, as I'll be uh, pointing out later on, the plants that are in a uh, uh, an environment with these huge animals, these huge herbivores, have a remarkable capacity to recover, even, even from damage that extensive. Uh, but maybe they don't recover from comprehensive damage uh, that you see, see here. This is also in Kruger in South Africa. And uh, uh, elephants have reduced this dry forest to, to, to rubble. And uh, as I'll soon point out, uh, they have a capacity to transform um, for us to a different kind of environment. So, uh, but this makes the point that yes, their their activities can have the most profound impact in altering the environment. Now, what you're seeing in this slide is a hill in Botswana. Um, it's dry forest, and uh, you can see that there's more than one tree species there. Uh, there's white trunk ones, red trunk ones, black trunk ones. Just superficially, you can see there's several species of trees. But look in the foreground. There you see um, uh, the real reason why those trees are there. And uh, uh, the dark objects are uh, sharp rocks, as vertically um, inserted in the soil or emerging from, from the soil with sharp points and edges. An elephant has a foot that, that's about a foot across and uh, it's basically a soft pad. So an elephant couldn't possibly walk across that terrain. It would be uh, agony with all those rocks. So that's why the, the dry forest is there. If we back off a bit and look at that from uh, another 100 to 200 meters away. You can see the dry forest on the hill. You can see the dark bands of rocks running across it. But in the foreground on alluvial soil, the vegetation is totally different. Um, it's uh, a monoculture of uh, what's locally called miambo. It's a, it's a legume. And uh, elephants are cropping it at regular intervals. Um, the uh, you can see the the, the effects of coppicing the the uh, miambo trees are multi-stemmed and uh, they sprout at the top well uh, here you uh, see in one picture the three themes of the uh, rest of the talk that i'll be giving today um, it is that the megafauna alter the structure the composition and the diversity 
of the plant communities that they feed upon. And here you can see very obvious differences in, in structure, um, very obvious differences in composition, the miombo and the alluvial, soft alluvial soil, and uh, many other species on that rocky hillside. And of course, a major difference in diversity and monoculture uh, against the mixed forest. So these are the three themes that uh, I'll be developing. And uh, they pertain to this dry forest. Uh, uh, and uh, that's been well known in the literature for a long time, because in an open environment like this, especially in the big national parks where animals are used to having uh, uh, land rovers full of tourists running around, uh, it is possible to, possible to observe them at reasonably close range. So, so there's a, quite a lot known about how elephants interact with uh, dry forest environments like this one. But um, as I said at the beginning, very little about what goes on inside of closed canopy rainforests. Now, I'll say a couple of things about herbivores and vegetations. Herbivores can alter the diversity of vegetation in, in a pretty major way, and uh, but it depends on the vegetation, uh, what the consequence of heavy herbivory is. Um, in, uh, in a grassland like this one, uh, the grass is very strongly competitive against other kinds of plants because uh, it reproduces and spreads it spreads primarily vegetatively. So that means that it has a huge advantage, can create dense stands and crowd out other things. And you can see another example of it here. There's two topi um, in a uh, grassland and uh, scattered here and there are little sprigs of green uh, from other species. But the diversity is very low. Now let's go to a rainforest. This is a, a picture of a, a little enclosure we had for an experiment in, in the Amazon forest of, of Peru. And this is what the early regeneration um, looks like in a rainforest. They're small plants, and they occur at a density of about 20 per square meter. The enclosure there is four square meters, so that gives you the scale. In uh, these plants are several kinds of herbs, like these ferns and some monocots. Um, there are trees, seedlings, and there are lianas. And uh, they're all mixed in at this relatively low density at which the competition between them is very low. So that's where the forest environment differs radically from a uh, grassland. It, the plant-to-plant -plant competition is very high in a grassland um, and very low, to practically non-existent in under the canopy of a tropical rainforest. Well, this is this is what we start with: these small plants that develop into um, finger finger diameter saplings, and then bigger bigger saplings as as um, species rise up into the into the interior of the forest in the and some of which eventually reach the canopy uh -oh. and, um my um my program is not advancing any further i'm stuck right here <laughs> I don't know. I'm sorry, friends. I the, my I don't know what to do. Is he going to Oh, there it went. I don't know what was the problem, but here we are. Okay. Um. Excuse me for that interruption, but uh, it's entirely unexpected. Um, so let's uh, let's go to Gabon, where we worked in Lope National Park, um, a place I consider that 
the true Garden of Eden. It is the most wonderful place I ever did research in all my life. And one of the reasons for that is, is that it has a completely intact fauna. There's nothing that's gone extinct there. Even the megafauna are, so far as we know, the megafauna that's been there for uh, for since before humans. And uh, I'm grateful to our African colleagues who uh, work with us in in Gabon. Uh, they're expert botanists. They did all the plant identification and they kept us safe in the forest because Lope has the highest recorded elephant density of any place ever ever surveyed. It's more than one elephant per square kilometer. And uh, if you meet an elephant in the forest at close range, uh, it's very dangerous. So uh, we put our lives in trust of our African colleagues. Now, in the rainforest, it's a very different environment from grassland, as I said. Um, it, it, the elephants um, eat small trees in the upper left. Uh, they break the stems and then strip the strip the crowns of the trees. They, they miss that one. And uh, really, they can find fairly small uh, trees, much smaller than the trees they'll attack in a, in a drier environment where they can reach the limbs and tear a tree apart one limb by the next. Um, in the forest, the crown's too high, and uh, all they have access to is the stem, and they to eat the foliage, they have to be able to break the stem, and it turns out that they can, they, they forage on trees that are between, they have a diameter between one and about four centimeters. Anything that's larger than four centimeters in diameter has escaped um, the risk of foraging and has it, has it scot-free from there on. But there's a period of vulnerability as the tree grows from one to four centimeters um, when there, there's a high likelihood of, of being attacked. In the lower left there, you see, uh, you can distinguish yourself, maybe half a dozen uh, different kinds of seedlings emerging from that elephant dung pat. Elephants are the, the most uh, important seed dispersers in the African forest. And uh, they are ecological engineers, not only for what they do to the vegetation, but for creating um, roads through the forest as as you see there in in the African forest you don't need a machete there are elephant trails that crisscross through the through the environment at, at distances of just a few meters apart i like to say that the parallel trails are only two trunk widths apart so that the elephants have access to essentially everything all right here's what the understory of an african this is in Lope, in fact, African forest looks like. And if you have much experience in, in this type of tropical forest, you'd say, well, that looks like a perfectly normal place. There's seedlings, they're uh, very small, so little thin stem saplings, they're pole sized saplings, they're small trees, big trees, it's all there. Um, and you wouldn't notice that there was something um, out of the ordinary there until you got to the point of counting things. And then you would realize, yes, these there's great deficiency. There are not nearly as many of most of these categories of plant size that you would expect. And this is why it's elephants have come in and harvested and you can see the broken off stems there in the foreground. They're all small diameters around finger dimensions. Um, the, the foraging was so recent that the uh, the leaves haven't even dried out yet. They're still green, lying there on the forest floor. So this is what a foraging patch looks like uh, at just after an elephant has left it. The big trees are unscathed, uh, but the consequences of this are really quite conspicuous if you have an eye for it. And this is just looking up into the canopy of the forest in in Lope and you'll see there's a there's a high uh, canopy overhead and then a great 
empty space underneath that. Now, if this were the Amazon where I spent an awful lot of my career, you would never, never see a, a scene like this because the middle and understory parts, the tiers of the forest are crowded with tree crowns. You, you can't see the canopy except maneuvering around, just getting a glimpse through a hole. You never get an open view like that. So this, uh, this is, again, a very important structural difference that uh, results from the, uh, the harvest of the smaller, smaller trees. And the result of that, you can see here, um, we did have one hectare tree plot, standard tree plots for in Gabon. And uh, the number of trees 10 centimeter diameter or greater was 377, whereas in Peru it was 618. Um, not quite twice as much, but uh, uh, a very substantial difference. And uh, there's a group with uh, under Fabio Berzaghi now who's, who's trying to study this, uh, another group at Oxford. Uh, what is it? How, how do you connect the dots between elephants and this drastic uh, structural difference of, of so many fewer trees in these elephant uh, dominated forests. The, the, the structure affects the entire, <laughs> the structural effects <clears throat> uh, <clears throat> operate across the entire size spectrum. Here, here are 10 plots on the upper frame <clears throat> from our Gabon work and then 10 plots on the lower frame uh, from our Peru work. These are one hectare standardized tree plots and uh, you can see the, uh, the distribution, the size distribution in uh, the upper frame, the Gabon one is much flatter than the uh, size distribution in the lower frame. The, uh, the Peruvian forests have many, many more small trees and many fewer large ones. Uh, the Gabonese forests have more large trees than any place I've ever seen in my life. The forests are absolutely magnificent. Um, and they're, as I showed you, they, they're much more open and uh, really it's a different experience there. So how do you study uh, foraging when you, when you can't observe the animal who's doing it? And so we started out uh, with uh, what I call forensic analysis of foraging by studying these break scars uh, after an elephant has broken a, a, a stem, um, many of them recover and initiate a new lead from near the break site, as you see in the one on the left. And sometimes uh, a, a, an individual's stem will suffer more than one attack. The one on the right has been broken twice. I've seen one up as many as four breaks on a single stem so that the the herbivore pressure on on small saplings that size is very heavy, and uh, uh, our Gabon sites had um, about 110 break scars uh, per 100 stems. Well, how do you get more than 100 breaks on 100 stems? Well, because some of them are multiple stems, like you see on the right there. Um, but uh, looking at this kind of data is uh, develops only part of a picture because uh, there's the nagging issue of how many stems die after they've been attacked rather than re-sprout and, and survive. And that question isn't easily answered uh, without uh, a different kind of observation. Now, but looking at the, at the break scars in Africa, um, you can see in two separate series of, of uh, data, one taken on flat ground, another taken on, on slopes. That was a different project. I won't go into it, but it, it finds a repetition uh, that shows that the, the modal height at which these, uh, these break scars occur in Africa is uh, between one and two meters and the incidence of scars drops off sharply on either side and um, 
that that is easy to associate with elephant foraging because uh, elephants break stems at about a meter and a half above the ground. Now, um, that still doesn't get us to the question of, of effects on composition. And uh, we were at a loss to um, provide much insight into that question of composition until this paper appeared by Annabel Cardoso, who was uh, with the Oxford group headed by, by Yadvinder Mali. They had been also in Lope. In fact, Lad Yadvinder and I shared plots, uh, so we collaborated some, but their project had to do with um, judging the damage to individual plants of, from elephant foraging. And so they were able to classify <laughs> a, a list, a considerable list of species as to the frequency and severity of, of attack. And as you see there, there were the one, one of these categories is strongly preferred, um, somewhat preferred and avoided. And uh, so if you, if you assume that these are uh, all uh, have equal possibilities of being in the, in the stand, then you have an expected. And then uh, we had data already from prior work to, to fill in the observed, the observed side. And uh, you can see very plainly there that the, that the observed and expected are quite radically distinct and that the observations uh, pile up at the bottom in the avoided category. In fact, 88% by this um, assessment, 88% of the saplings in the understory at Lope were of avoided species. So effectively, uh, elephants are a huge um, filter that, that uh, skews the composition towards avoided species. And that in itself raises a question, well, how do preferred species um, persist in the environment at all? I'm, if I have time, I'll get back to that, to that question. Okay. Well. Now, uh, these structural differences are really quite profound. And uh, that comes out in this diagram, which shows two sites in, in Gabon, Lope with a very high density of elephants, Monda, which was the forest attached to the forestry school near the capital of Libreville. It hadn't had any elephants for three or four decades previously, but it was an intact forest. And then, um, the data from the Peruvian Amazon to compare. Now let's start with that Peru data. Um, there are four categories of stems there, small saplings, large saplings, small trees, those between 10 and 20 centimeters in diameter. And then the purple are the large trees, the canopy, if you will. And you see there, <laughs> we're measuring Fisher's alpha, a, a, uh, a sample size insensitive measure of, of diversity. And uh, the small saplings have the highest diversity in Peru. And the, as you go up through the forest, uh, the diversity of stems um, decreases in a stepwise fashion. Now, this is exactly what you'd expect um, from an intuitive standpoint, because every stem that gets to the canopy um, has to go through the understory and midstory. So uh, you'd expect everything to be present at the lowest level and then a thinning out as <coughs> species reach their characteristic heights at different levels. Now go to the left to look at what what the situation is at Lope. Uh, quite the opposite. The highest diversity is in the canopy. And that is uh, a direct consequence of this 
massive filtering that goes on in understory that uh, reduces the uh, diversity of of the smaller size categories. Uh, the small saplings are generally smaller than elephants will bother to harvest, so that the diversity is still moderate there. The large sapling, that's the red column, that diversity hits rock bottom there, and then uh, gradually it comes uh, back up. And But the peak diversity is in the in the canopy, and uh, that presents a, 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 a really uh, a challenging puzzle because you have to wonder, well, how do all those other species get there? We looked at more than 5,000 small stems in our sampling in Gabon, and there were many species that are common in the canopy that we never saw. So the, the regeneration that gets these canopy species um, in their in their mature stage in the uh, is is an invisible process. Uh, you'd have to f look for a hundred thousand stems. I don't know where oh, you'd find it. At any rate, uh, there's a bit of a mystery there. Um, how is the canopy more diverse than any of the earlier stages? Now let's look at Monda. This is this forest that lost its elephants is too close to the capital and I, you know you can imagine how the elephants disappeared but <laughs> if you look at the canopy diversity it's exactly the same as is lope and that's probably due to uh, this uh, lingering signal that uh, because the canopy was established um, way back in time many many decades long before the uh, uh, elephants were um, eliminated from the forest, but if you look at the the other size classes. They've jumped way up. The diversity is twice, three times higher uh, than it than it was at Lope. And so this we refer to as diversity release. Uh, diversity is suppressed by uh, the uh, constant pressure of herbivory, a top down uh, forcing, and then when you, elephants are removed, then um, the diversity comes back. So it indicates that the seed sources for lots of species that are very difficult to find as saplings have to be there in the forest somewhere. So they're refugia, perhaps both in space and time, uh, in which these species um, are able to maintain themselves. But if you just sample a forest at random, uh, a, a lot of the species in the canopy you just simply don't find as small small stem. So that uh, uh, the point they to make here is that yes, diversity is suppressed by herbivory. You release the herbivory, and diversity will bounce back. And that's uh, uh, that's an interesting. Uh, <laughs> Uh, contrast to what normally happens when you perturb a forest, it uh, usually results in the opposite the loss of diversity. Now, to show that this canopy effect, that, that the canopy is of these African forests is actually more diverse than the small tree category, we use about 10, uh, 10 one hectare plots, uh, but from a great variety of places with varied elephant density. So on the left, you see the canopy is more diverse than the small small tree category. Um, but in Peru, on the right, it's the other way around. And as I pointed out in the last slide, that's a normal expectation that diversity is going to decrease as you look at higher and higher strata. And it's, uh, it was a very big surprise to find that that wasn't true in in Gabon. Now let's go to Malaysia, where we worked from 2015 to 2019 in this area. This is Royal Bellum Park. It's a marvelous place. It has suffered some extinctions. The rhinos, the forest rhinos, Sumatran and Javan aren't there anymore. But um, other than that, it, it's about as intact an Asian fauna as, uh, as survives anywhere. And Krau is our comparison locality it's some it's here east of uh, Kuala Lumpur 
uh, we work with a large number of collaborators. Our, uh, our host, uh, Imsa Campos Arceis, in the upper left, was then at uh, the University of Nottingham branch in Kuala Lumpur. And um, um, he was he was really the person that made all this happen and found a lot of the financing. Uh, so we're greatly indebted to him. But I also want to mention these two guys in the top central frame. Um, they are of the Chuang, uh, in, an indigenous group of uh, what are called Orang Asli in Malaysia, original people, they're forest dwelling people that um, are really living apart from the main flow of society in Malaysia, but they are amazing in the forest. I've never seen better botanists anywhere, even professional botanists would be envious of the encyclopedic knowledge these guys had of, of plants. So we were able to work with them and and work at the species level that uh, would um, would have otherwise been impossible. So let's let's compare the stem break height distribution in Gabon. That's a little inset at the top with um, with Malaysia, the two localities that we studied there. Belem having uh, Belem rather Belem having uh, um, ecological densities of elephants. And um, Crow having lost, uh, like Monda, its elephants several decades earlier. And you see the uh, the uh, stem break heights are skewed now towards the lower of less than one meter. So uh, it doesn't implicate elephants very strong. There's still some fair number between one and two meters. But uh, there are a lot of stems being broken in Asian forest at less than one meter, and I'll, uh, I'll, we know the answer to that, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute. Now, I told you with the Gabon data that uh, removing elephants and uh, perhaps other large herbivores from the mammal community of a forest results in the release of diversity to uh, reach much higher levels. And we saw that in Gabon there, the, the Gabon data on the left uh, with the elephant minus uh, the Monda having twice, uh, three times the uh, diversity uh, at the, as at Lope. And similarly, we found the same thing in Malaysia. Um, the the uh, release of diversity at Crow was really quite spectacular. In fact, I have never seen a forest anywhere in the world that had anything like the diversity at, at Crow. It was it was it was just stupefying. But those Orang Asli people, they knew everything. They're really they're very impressive in how they how well they know the forest. So in Malaysia, we had a wonderful opportunity uh, thanks to Ahimsa uh, and his his astute politicking with the wildlife officials in Malaysia we were able to borrow some elephants and uh, for uh, an utterly wonderful week but we went out in the forest with these these compliant elephants and uh, we're able to observe them and take detailed data at close range as to exactly what they were doing. And uh, that solved a lot of mysteries for us. I won't have time to go into all of it, but you can see here we were um, uh, with elephants mainly uh, concentrating on their foraging. The mahouts got off and let the elephants just go free. Um, they didn't run away, they just went what got down to business of foraging or wherever we put them. And uh, they were uh, uh, astonishingly uh, willing subjects of this, this research. And uh, I came away just utterly, utterly uh, uh, impressed with the ability of elephants to select plants out of this jumble of foliage. They're no, they're, the trunk moves around and it's, obviously uh, using olfaction to to find and distinguish one plant from another and then it will select just one thing out of that jumble and if it's a little vine it may patiently un, 
unwind it from around the stem and then gather it in and eat it. <clears throat> um, so they are extremely selective in their foraging. And uh, here are here are the results that we got from our week of, of close-in observations of, of these uh, compliant animals. And uh, we all got developed a big affection for them, I'll say. Um, it turns out Asian elephants are monocot specialists. And so uh, if you see the, 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 the horizontal line at, at a value of one that goes across the bottom of the, the figure um, is the preference ratio. And when it's more than one, um, it means that uh, that category of plants is eaten in excess of its representation in the, in the uh, vegetation. Um, if it's less than one, um, it's not eaten uh, in proportion to its abundance. And so you see that the, the three bars that are farthest above the, um, the ratio of one are bamboo, grass, and palms, uh, all of them monocots. And then following behind that, herbs, uh, liana saplings, and then tree saplings way over on the right. A lot of other things they don't eat much at all. But um, the highest preference scores went to palms and bamboo. Uh, Asian elephants, unlike African forest elephants, are monocot happy. They, they eat dicot trees just the way the African forest elephants do, but they're less preferred and they, they concentrate on palms. And forests like the Bellum was almost free of palms. And yet when we went to Crow where there hadn't been elephants for a while, the forest was just crowded with them. It was such a, such a huge contrast. So here's a place where Asian elephants had been uh, foraging, but uh, on bamboo rather than on, than on tree saplings. Oh, okay, there is a reason behind this. Um, we don't have elephants today. We had just a few thousand years ago. All over the world, um, in North America, South America, Asia, Europe, um, wherever you went, uh, the fossil record shows us that there were two elephants, uh, a browser and a grazer. And so... Uh, on the upper left is the uh, is a molar of the African savanna elephant. It has what's called lophodont the veg, the uh, dentition, all those cusps. Um, below it is a fossil jaw from an, a North American mastodon, which, like the African forest elephant, is a browser. So that lofa. Uh, uh, Lofodont vegetation is associated with browsing habits. On the upper right is a modern Asian elephant, and it has these, these closely spaced ridges. Um, and uh, below it is a fossil tooth of a, of a mammoth, which, like Asian elephants, is adapted for grazing. In fact, the, the, you know, the Arctic... Uh, Woolly mammoth lived on uh, on a steppe like grassland, ate almost entirely grass. Now, Asian elephants, as we saw in our work, can live in, and do live in the forest, but at uh, reduced densities because their their favorite monocot food is not as not as abundant in the forest environment as as the dicot trees. Uh, African elephants attain, therefore, much higher densities. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier that the stem height distribution we found in the Asian forest was loaded towards the very small end. And this is why. It's a surprising reason. Uh, it's due to pigs. Um, Sus grofar, you know, the wild, the wild the progenitor of our domestic pig. And uh, the pigs um, like uh, elephants on a smaller scale, uh, can uh, break a lot of saplings. And uh, here is a place where a sow had 
harvested saplings, not to eat, but to make a nest. The pigs build a nest in the forest and they have their babies underneath a huge pile of something like a beaver house, but in the middle of the forest, I don't really understand how it provides them with sufficient protection, but that's what they do. <clears throat> and and so uh, this area of about 20 meters across had been cleared of every small stem that was there and the tops had been carted off for their use in, in the nest and leaving the, uh, the broken stems behind. So um, I went around and uh, counted all the stems and noted whether each one had, uh, had, had died or had re-sprouted and continued to grow. And 94% of them um, were alive and well and regrowing. So uh, what seems like a rather drastic um, impact to us, that is a, a, a giant herbivore coming along, snapping a stem, breaking breaking the plant in two, it seems, it seems like brutal and drastic treatment that you would think would have dire consequences. But as we, as we see in both Africa and Asia, uh, the vegetation is has a long history of adaptation to this kind of herbivory, and in, in general, it doesn't kill plants. It sets them back; they grow more slowly, um, but um, they stay alive and they can uh, continue to develop in the forest. So, what have we learned? Um, I started out by saying we're going to look at effects on structure, composition, and diversity, and I hope I've I've done that. Um, uh, megafaunal foraging uh, very decisively reduce uh, the densities of of uh, small saplings in the uh, understory, and that has um, consequences for the later development of these stems into the mid-story and canopy and reduces the total number of trees, the total density of trees, as we saw in those uh, data comparing Gabon and Peru. Uh, regardless of, of the uh, uh, species of elephant, um, they both show very, very high levels of selectivity in Gabon. Uh, the, but the only thing they'd leave in the forest are avoided species. And in Asia, um, they can clean the forest out of monocots. So uh, the selectivity <clears throat> reduces the diversity um, uh, in a very uh, uh, selective, uh, selective way. Now, the... Uh, the concentration of avoided species in the understory is felt observed in the next larger size category, that of small trees, which are uh, extremely undiverse in Gabon in comparison with the canopy. As I say, we have a mystery. How does how do all these other species get into the canopy? Well, I think they have to have uh, refugia in space or time, but uh, just where what these are haven't yet been identified. And finally, uh, in both both of our studies in Asia and Africa, we noticed uh, this release of diversity from uh, as a response to the removal of the pressure of herbivory on the uh, on the. Uh, small plants in the understory. So that's where we are, friends. I'd be uh, very happy to entertain questions if you have any. Thank you very much for hearing me out. I'm not hearing you. Oh, the other one, a big one. Okay, no, I am. I am. That's good. Mm -hmm. Anybody have any questions? Okay, folks. Is there any questions? Anybody online or here in the 
in the audience. I'd like to answer a question from John. It's pretty high level stuff he's doing. Um, he's had a long history of doing that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, sort of um, creating sort of environmental narratives, I would say, in some sense, and tying a lot of different things together. It's a real, oh, can you hear me, John? Yes, I hear you fine. Okay, so question, Susan? Okay, one, one second. Hi, John, oh, wow. Susan Lawrence. Oh, hi, Susan. Mm -hmm. Um, so you've talked about the selective pressure on the community composition, but the megafauna itself must be removing a fair bit of plant biomass and redistributing that through the ecosystem as well. And I'm really curious about the impacts that that has on the forest structure. So do you find that you said that the Gabon forests were really big, but I'm, I'm interested, there's not a driver for them to be tall forests if there's not the stem competition of stem number. So do you think, would you see more spreading canopies? I guess my interest in is in forest structure. Like if there's not the competition in, in stem density, do we find that the trees can, do they need to grow so tall and can they just spread out their canopies? No, there seems to be plenty of competition. It's just that the the crowns average larger. They fill in all the all the space. So even though they're not as many trees, they they're bigger trees. So uh, I don't think that the competition to get in the canopy is any any less. Um, and uh, but there, the, it, your question does uh, raise a an important issue, and uh, it's been referred to. It was discovered in in Serengeti by McNaughton now about 50 years ago, and it's called grazing optimization. It's a very funny term, but it, it refers to the fact that <clears throat> herbivores recycle nutrients on a short time scale. Now, if you take the herbivores away, um, the, 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 the nutrients contained in, in live plants eventually find their way back into the soil, but only after the plant dies and gradually decomposes. But if it's eaten by a herbivore today, it's returned to the soil tomorrow. And that is a hugely accelerated um, recycling of nutrients. And that has profound effects on the growth of the forest. So I think what we've done, this has been studied by Chris Doty and, and Yadvinder Mali's group at Oxford, and uh, it's a very general phenomenon. We found it in Guri with howler monkeys, if you please. Uh, so, um, what uh, what humans have done effectively by reducing or eliminating big herbivores from from our forests is is shortcut this this recycling mechanism. And that greatly slows down the the uh, the growth rate of the forest because the nutrients have to be processed through decomposition rather than just uh, returned in available form um, at, at a very prompt prompt uh, way. So this is this is one thing that I I think is underappreciated about the roles that large herbivores play. They actually create a, a richer, more dynamic environment that is overall a lot more productive than, than one that uh, lacks big herbivores. Um, that's, uh, so of course, all of that, that extra dynamism and, and rapid growth will feed back into the structure and species composition and in complex ways, but as a, as an overall way of thinking about this, I think that's a, a very a, a very powerful um, discovery that, that 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 even in close canopy forests, this process of grazing optimization—I really don't like the term—but that's what it is—is uh, is, uh, is a a major major factor. <laughs> I'd like to make—I just recall—I. <clears throat> 
I'd like to make one further comment of my own, if I could, and that has to do with with um, the uh, the pigs that we found to be ubiquitous in Malaysia and very very uh, uh, major role players in in forest dynamics. By uh, wherever we went in in Bellum and Crow, a pig sign was everywhere. We just couldn't couldn't find a place where you couldn't turn around in a few feet. Find uh, find the signs that pigs have been damaging the vegetation. Now, those forests are adapted to pigs. They've been there for perhaps millions of years, but now through uh, domestic pigs, um, Susgrofa has been introduced to nearly every island in the Pacific, uh, to uh, Australia, to North America, to South America, and. Uh, None of those places have vegetation that's adapted to to the stem break process of harvesting. And so the pigs, I think, have the potential <clears throat> to drastically alter vegetation. We we haven't fully appreciated that here, and I don't know how well it's been studied in Australia, but uh, uh, as an in, invasive species, uh, they uh, they present a huge threat to the integrity of, of vegetation and uh, uh, needing more study, I would say, in places where they're not, where they're not native. Great, any other questions? I was just gonna mention while we're waiting for the next question, if there's another one, um, you know, the feral pigs, another thing, John, I think is, uh, you know, feral pigs are being introduced into a lot of places where you've got sort of human dominated landscapes and you end up with the juxtaposition of like agriculture with forest. And that's yeah. perfect for pigs. Shelter, food, thank you very much. And so they can build up into very high populations as John's talking about there. So they really can't be a problem. Any other yeah. questions? Uh, sorry, John. Can you hear me? Yes, I go ahead, Damien. Hi, uh, sorry. Um, I just wanted to ask a, a question. I was curious about the the Gabon uh, forest elephant population, whether or not you regard that population in equilibrium, in the sense that um, that forest is hasn't exceeded its carrying capacity, and this would be regarded as a natural equilibrium, or are there pressures on fragmentation of forest in in Gabon that would actually drive more? forest elephants in higher densities in those forests um, that would suggest that, that this sort of forest structure that you're seeing is actually abnormal? Uh, yeah, well, that's a good question. And uh, it uh, relates to what Bill just said about pigs. Now, there's uh, there's been a study of the impact of pigs at a uh, forest called Paso. It's sort of a, 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 a flagship <laughs> forest. It's a 50 hectare plot. It's one of the uh, the most studied forests in Asia. And as Bill saying, it was in a, a, a landscape that was a mosaic of forest, and in this case, oil palm plantations. And uh, the, the pig density in the Paso forest is estimated to be 10 to 100 times normal. In, in other words, just drastically off scale. So this arrangement of the uh, the, the the human effect of human impacts in, in encouraging uh, increased densities of, of pigs was was uh, uh, enormous enormous now um, as for the elephants in in Lope uh, we don't think so because they've been studied there for a long time with by uh, uh, Lee White and others and uh, the Gabon is is as I said, it's like the Garden of Eden. It's nothing else like it because the people, and this is the consequence of the French administration before World War II that, that brought people into population centers uh, with the result that, that much of the forest was abandoned of, of its human population because the French wanted uh, to you know, to control the population, but also provide education and health services. So the population in Gabon, it's a small, it's about the size of our state of Colorado, but has only about a million and a half people. And the 80 or 90% of them live in three or four towns and the rest of it's wild. The, 
So you have the inverse of what you see in most countries where humans dominate the entire landscape and wildlife is restricted to a few little patches that are that are declared to be parks. And uh, But Gabon's the other way around. The humans are in little enclaves and the elephants are everywhere else. And uh, so there, there hasn't been this compression process in Gabon. If anything, there's been uh, been some poaching. Uh, it hasn't reached low pace for us, I know, but uh, some some of the parks in, in Gabon have suffered some poaching, but nevertheless, the Gabon holds something like 60% of the remaining forest elephants in the whole world. It is the place where forest elephants are still, that's still living more or less in, at ecological densities. Yeah, thank you. That's uh, it's almost the opposite of of, of what we see in uh, in Cote d'Ivoire with the forest elephants there and fragmentation of primary rainforest there. So you've got low densities of of forest elephants there and higher pressure on habitats from agricultural expansion and so on. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, right. That's more like the Paso situation. Well, John, we're we're just moving past our window of time, and we really want to thank you very much. I don't even know what time it would be there in Florida, but I'm I'm imagining it's some wee hours of the morning. Is that? It's just two o'clock, Bill. Two o'clock in the morning. Oh well, <laughs> uh, John. Yeah, big hand. For John. <laughs> It's very much appreciated, John, and we look forward to seeing you next time you get up here with Cans, Cans, or down here with us here in Cans. But anyway, well, we look we look forward to it too, and I'm I'm glad you invited me to do this. A bit of pleasure. So, best to you all. Real pleasure for us, John. Real treat. So, thank you again, and thanks everybody. Thank you for coming. Okay.